praise the Lord. Before we hear the preach of God's word today, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy faithfulness in preserving thy pure words for us. For though heaven and earth shall pass away, thy word, O Lord, shall be forever. Thy word, O Lord, endureth forever. The word which by the gospel is preached unto us, and we praise thee, O God, as thou hast magnified the word above all of thy name. For thy word is truth, that thou dost even sanctify us with thy truth. Pray in us even sanctify and cleanse us by the washing and the water of the word. They may present unto thee, O Lord, a glorious church, not having spot the wrinkle any such thing, to be holy and without blemish, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Once again in Matthew chapter 24, continue where we left off last week. In Matthew chapter 24, Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come, and this is the day we're living in, when the scriptures be fulfilled, in my name, saying, I am Christ, or I am anointed, and shall deceive many. We're living in these days that Christ has warned us about, the last days where Christ comes again, because in Matthew chapter 24, the Lord is answering three questions. What are those three questions the Lord is answering? Verse 3, And as he sat up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What things? Verse 1 and verse 2, When the temple then should be destroyed, which has been fulfilled. Therefore, Matthew chapter 24, some of the verses have already been fulfilled in about 70, around 70 A.D., when the then temple was destroyed. But that's not the only thing Christ is answering. He is also answering, And what shall be the sign of thy coming? Christ is coming again. We know not the day nor the hour that it cometh again. No man knoweth the day that it cometh again. And Christ has said, has said, is not for us to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Acts chapter 1, verse 7. But he has given to us signs. And these signs are being fulfilled today. And knowing that Christ is coming again, we see the signs of his coming again. And the third question and of the end of the world. Therefore, when Christ comes again, it's not yet the end of the world. Christ is coming again for what? To rapture his church. To take his church out of this world. Because he's going to judge this world. And we know that the Lord must first rapture his church from this world. Because the Bible says we are what? ambassadors for Christ. And anybody who does war, if you said any war history, before one nation or group of people declares war on other people, they must recall their ambassadors first. Just like we said about the Mongolians. And before they would attack different places, what did they send first? Their ambassadors, such as the Quasar Quasarium Empire. And when they sent, that was the last of the caliphate. And when they sent the Mongolian ambassadors, what did they do there at the Quasarium Empire? They killed all the ambassadors. What did Genghis Khan do after that? He sent two more ambassadors. What did they at the Quasarium Empire do? Beheaded one of them, shaved the other one's beard off, and sent him back to Genghis Khan with the head of that ambassador. And then, out of places they never could dream of, the Mongolians arrived. At that time, there's only one pass through the mountains that they were ready for and thought they could beat the Mongolians. And the Khwarezm Empire had their army ready. Genghis Khan did the impossible. They went through the other mountainous range, which was impossible to cross, and a desert, which was impossible to cross. How did the Mongolians cross that desert? 
They knew how to cut the veins of the horses, drink just enough blood from the horses to replenish themselves, sew the vein back up to keep the horse alive, and cross an impassable desert, and all of a sudden, the Mongolians had surrounded their whole city, I believe it was Achor, Ator, and then completely destroyed them because of what they did to their ambassadors. When Christ comes again, he's going to make Genghis Khan look like a choir boy. That's right. The Lord is not coming again as a suffering servant. He is coming again as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is coming again as a conquering king. Just like I told you about, I've read one bumper sticker, had what they thought was what Jesus looked like on top of a horse with blood up to his up to the horse's reins, and it said, guess who's coming back? And boy, is he mad. When Christ comes again to judge this world, it's going to be war. He's going to judge this world, but before he does so, he's going to recall us his ambassadors. Therefore, his coming again and the end of the world are two separate events. And here in Matthew chapter 24, he answers those three questions. And one of the signs of his coming is, many shall come in his name. To do what? Saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Once again, we saw last week in Acts chapter 20, where should these false teachers, these, these whom Christ has warned us about, these deceivers, come in his name? Where would they come from? Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Once again, that is written, the Apostle Paul, speaking of the church of Ephesus, speaking and written here under this phrase the ghost, take heed therefore to yourselves all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost of the major overseers, to feed the church of God, which is the purchase with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock. Acts 20, verse 30. Also of your own selves. Who? The blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. Who? The spirit-filled church. This is the church of Ephesus. And it was a spirit-filled church. They were disciples of Jesus Christ. They were followers of Christ. And out of the blood-bought church, spirit-filled followers of Jesus Christ, shall what? Verse 30. Shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them, to stop following the Lord, but to follow them, to lead them astray. And then it goes on to say, and now, the, uh, verse 31, Therefore watch, and remember the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone, night and day with tears. What does this show us? There is no perfect group. There is no perfect church. Too many Christians are looking for the perfect church. Too many Christians looking for the perfect group. Too many Christians are seeking for that group that's perfect that they can get along with. There's no such thing. Even from the blood-bought, spirit-filled church shall arise false prophets, deceivers, speaking perverse things to draw disciples away after them, away from the Lord. Therefore, we must not look for a perfect church or for a perfect group of people. And therefore, that should be, we shall not be shocked nor amazed that even from a good group of people, spirit-filled, blood-bought Christians, false teachers shall arise. Therefore, it shall not amaze us when those who we thought were blood-bought, spirit-filled go false, start teaching falsely, and start to draw disciples away after them to be followers of them rather than Jesus Christ. It shall not amaze us. The apostle warned them for three years night and day with tears. As Christ has warned us before he comes again, many shall come in his name. Many from the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ, many that are spirit-filled, shall rise and deceive many, saying, I am Christ, saying they're anointed, 
saying they're spirit filled, saying that they're called and shall deceive many. These are the end times. The apostle warned them there at Ephesus for three years, night and day, with tears. And it's that way even today. Therefore, we don't look for a perfect group. Then we're not amazed when uh, this group of Christians, we see false teachers arrive, or from that group of Christians. It doesn't amaze us in the Pentecostal churches, there's many who speak in tongues, but don't have the Holy Ghost. It doesn't amaze us that in KJV-only churches, there's many who use the KJV, but don't even believe in it. Yes, I've met them. I've met KJV-only pastors who told me openly it was a scam. They just in it for the money openly said so and when I was shocked how bold they said it what Tony are you that naive are you that naive? are you that naive a pastor KJV only is supported for being KJV only he says it was all a scam it was just to make some money he was a deceiver that we just they just recently celebrated Thanksgiving yesterday or today in America and 20 Years or 21 years ago, we're invited to a Thanksgiving meal amongst independent Baptists, KJV only. And after the end of the meal, we found out none of them believed in the KJV, though they claimed to be KJV only. And they mocked and laughed at us for actually believing it was the Word of God. Now, those missionaries, a whole group of them, Lots of them celebrating Thanksgiving back in 2001. Yeah, 2001, 21 years ago. A whole group of them, after the meal was ended, we're all talking together. They thought that we were foolish and ignorant. They could not believe that we actually believe that this version of the Bible, the authorized version of the Bible, is the Word of God. And they were called KJV only. It's in their doctrinal statement. But for them, they didn't even believe in it. It was a scam. They were deceivers. These things don't amaze us. These things don't shock us. The Bible has already forewarned us that even from the blood-bought, spirit-filled church, false deceivers and false teachers shall arise. Just as we saw last week, an example. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, the Lord Jesus Christ says, in the Revelation chapter 2, verse 15. So hast thou awesome them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Why did the Lord hate this doctrine, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Because in Revelation chapter 2, Verse 6, it is written, But this thou hast, thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Christ hated their doctrine because their doctrine produced false deeds. Their doctrines produce deeds the Lord hates. Therefore, we learn from this who the Nicolaitans were. Now, of course, in today's church, they try to make it somebody they're not. We go back to the early church. And Arrhenius, back there in the 2nd century, he wrote who these Nicolaitans were, what they believed, as he wrote a big, long teaching. It's almost an encyclopedia of all the different Gnostic sects at that time. And you can learn who the false teachers were at that time, and it's still the same today, and there's no new thing under the sun. And the Nicolaitans came from Acts chapter In the book of the Acts, the Apostles, chapter 6, verse 5. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Prochorus, and Nicanor and Timon, and Perminius, Perminus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Who were these seven men? The Bible says in verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look yet among you seven men of honest report. These seven men had an honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. These seven men were not only born of this God's Spirit, they were full of the Holy Ghost. They were spirit-filled Christians. 
they weren't just tongue-talking Christians. They were full of the Holy Ghost. You see, there's a lot of Christians out there that think that if they speak in tongues, that means they have the Holy Ghost. No. It's much more than tongues and being filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, we do not disagree with tongues. Tongues is in the Bible. Tongues is for today. The Bible says so to forbid not the speaking of tongues. However, it is not an evidential sign of being filled with the Holy Ghost. Because in Acts chapter 8, we re Acts chapter 8, we read of the Samaritans, and they received the Holy Ghost, but we don't read about tongues. There's a lot of Christians that they, speak in tongues to get the Holy Ghost. And a lot of them mimic. A lot of them fake it. And they don't think, he's God, he's got the Holy Ghost. No, they don't. Just because he's talking in tongues does not mean he's got the Holy Ghost. Now, if there's ever a documentary that Christians should watch is a documentary that was made in the 1970s. The documentary name is Marjo, about a young boy who became a young boy evangelist. They thought he was a miracle and made millions for his family as a young boy preaching the gospel. They thought he was a miracle. He backslid, of course, his parents divorced, his father took all the money, and then he had to keep doing that to make money to support himself and his mother. In the teenage years, he backslid and then had to continue to do these crusades to make money so he could backslide in sin. And then he's so convicted, he made a documentary exposing himself. He hired a documentary team to expose himself and all the inner workings that take place amongst those kind of Christians. And why do I think he was a miracle? Because any child, children copy others. That's what children do. And there in a Pentecostal church, he saw them all speaking in tongues. He decided to do it as well, and they thought he's got it. And then he saw how they preach. He just copied them, and his parents trained him to do so, and he became a sideshow to make a bunch of money. They made him a show, a showman to make the money, as those deceivers do. What does this teach us? Just because somebody speaks in tongues, it does not mean they have the Holy Ghost. But here in Acts chapter 6, these seven men were full of the Holy Ghost. They weren't faking it here. The Bible says they were full of the Holy Ghost and of honest report and wisdom whom we, the apostles, may appoint over this business. And the apostles even laid their hands upon them. Verse 6, whom, these seven, they set before the apostles, and when they prayed, they laid their hands on them. The seven men were of honest report, were full of the Holy Ghost, were full of wisdom, and the apostles even prayed and laid their hands upon them. Just because a minister is ordained does not mean he's of God. Just because a minister is ordained does not mean he can turn false. Here was an ordained minister ordained by the apostles themselves, hands of the apostles laid upon them, and Nicholas went astray, began teaching false doctrines, perverse things, to draw disciples after him. They became known as the Nicolaitans, named after him, not Christians, not following Christ, following Nicholas, this false teacher, teaching false doctrines that produced deeds the Lord hates. An example for us from the Word of God about this can easily happen. And Christ says in the last days, Take heed that no man deceive you. They shall rise even from the blood-bought, spirit-filled church. Even those that are full of the Holy Ghost are ordained even by the apostles themselves. Teaching perverse things, doctrines Christ hates, producing forth deeds that Christ hates, to draw disciples after them. What were they called once again? Nicolaitans. They followed Nicholas. What were they not called? Christians. They weren't following Christ. And how is it these can do that? How is it Nicholas could do that? Jeremiah chapter 23. Beginning in verse 9, it is written, My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. That reminds us of today. All the preachers today, 
all the false teachers, all the false prophets, it breaks our hearts. Because of them, the way of truth is evil spoken of. Making merchandise of the people of God, it breaks our hearts. What did the Apostle Paul, who wrote on this special ghost, she rejoiced in her always, and again I say rejoice, when he warned the church of for three years, night and day, how did he do so? With tears. These things hurt us. These things make us upset. We don't rejoice there's false prophets today. We don't rejoice all the false preachers out there today. We don't rejoice with the false doctors. It breaks our heart of what is happening today. We take encouragement. It was happening even in Jeremiah's day. My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I'm like a drunken man. And like a man whom wine hath overcome because of the Lord, because of the words of his holiness. For the land is full of adulterers. Today, the church is full of adulterers. When people understand what we preach from God's word, the words of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, when people understand what we call adulterers from the words of Christ, they say to us, you've got to be wrong. Because if you're right, that means everybody's in adultery. That's right. Christ says, straight is the gate and narrow is a way that leads to life and few there be that find it because broad is the way and wine is the gate that lead to destruction and many there be there at the church is full of adulterers just like in jeremiah's day the land is full of adulterers for because of swearing the land mourneth the pleasant place of the winters are drying up and their course is evil and their force is not right. Verse 11, for both prophet and priest are profane. In my house, the house of the Lord, I have found wickedness, saith the Lord. This is the same today. The prophet and the priest, the pastor and the prophet, the pastor and the preacher is all profane. And in the Lord's house, in the church today, you can find wickedness in the church today. Now, when I was a young boy, 12 years old, I almost went to hell. When I was a young boy, 12 years old onward, till I was 21, I was in danger of hell. If I had died at that time, I'd have went to hell because of. When I was 12 years old, once again, my grandparents took me to a church to water baptize me, a non-denominational church, which is a denomination. They believed in baptismal regeneration. They believed the waters of baptism washed away your sins. And at 12 years old, they did that to me. I knew not Jesus. I didn't know the word of God. I didn't know the gospel. But they water baptized me and said the waters had washed away my sins. And I became now a church member. And we began faithfully going to church and Sundays and youth group on Sunday evenings, Monday evenings, roller skating. And then I think Friday, some other youth group meeting, very active in the church, going to vacation, Bible schools, and youth group meetings, and things such as that. But a few months later, the pastor was caught in adultery with the secretary of the church. That means they're committing adultery in the church but itself. And that's not a rare thing. That happens everywhere in churches today, just like happening here in the days of Jeremiah. For both, verse 11, for both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, my house have I found their wickedness, say the Lord. Wherefore the ways shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein. For I will bring evil upon them, even the year of the visitation, say the Lord. And I have seen fall in the prophet Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused me both Israel to err. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hand of of evildoers, and none, that none doeth return from their with wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the Hamaster of as Gomorrah. What did they do? What was this horrible thing? They came in adultery, and walk in lies, and they strengthen also the hands of evildoers, and none doth return from his wickedness. Therefore the all of them unto the Lord as Sodom, and the Hamaster of as Gomorrah by their doctrines, strengthening the hands of sinners. God understands your situation. You're fine. No, no, you're okay. Yeah, the Bible says this. You're fine. God understands. 
No, no, God overlooks that sin. You do so much good anyway. God overlooks your sin. How many churches today? Sinners in the church, their hands get strengthened in their sin. It's okay for them to sin. The, the pastors, the prophets, the preachers continue to strengthen their hands in their wickedness and dare not preach to them to repent and dare not preach to them to get right with God. No, they'd rather encourage them in their sin. They want their church to be seeker sensitive. They want the sinners to feel right at home in church and dare not warn the sinners to repent, but instead strengthen their hands in wickedness. God understands. He knows your habits. And he'll help you break those habits because God loves you so much. You're so wonderful. They strengthen the hands of evildoers. Sinners come into churches and get encouraged in their sins. It's nothing about you. It's all about Jesus. There's nothing you can do. You just look to Jesus. That's all you got to do. You're once saved. You're always saved. God doesn't look at any of your works. They strengthen the hands of the sinners. And the sinners refuse to repent. They're not preached or exhorted to repent. They're not reproved. They're not rebuked. They're not exhorted by long suffering and doctrine. They don't repent. In fact, they teach today to not preach repentance in the churches today. And sinners come to churches today wanting to be encouraged in their sins. Back in 2002, a group from Maui, Hawaii, came here on a mission trip. They met with me at the airport on that very night as we're preaching on Jalungkrung Road, that is Thailand's first paved road. There was a Mohammedan mosque in a market there. We're preaching right for the Mohammedan mosque, and a local mafia figure was very upset, and he, he confronted me and pulled out all of his idols and said, what did I think about that? And that was back in those days, the godfathers will wear a whole bunch of idols. And as I told them, they have eyes cannot see, ears cannot hear, mouths cannot speak, hands have they cannot handle, feet have they they cannot walk, and they that trust should be like in them. He grabbed one of the pestles from a pestle and mortar and was going to hit me with it. Praise the Lord. And then he paid from some motorbike tax drivers to follow us. But we took the bus. We didn't have any money. I had to go to the airport to the bus. And I remember went to the back of the bus and waved to those motorbike taxis because they didn't want to follow this bus to the airport. And even the motorbike taxis gave us a thumbs up. We got them. Praise the Lord. We arrived to this airport to meet this team from Maui, this mission team. And they didn't want to come with us because they wanted to sit at a five-star hotel. They needed non-smoking rooms. And they had to have CNN in their rooms. Now, the place I'd line up for them, I did not know if they had CNN or not. I didn't know if they had non-smoking rooms. I'd never heard of such a thing. They refused to come with us. And one of the members on the mission team and myself went to the payphone and was looking up all these five hotels already booked and they couldn't find a room. We spent hours at the airport. Finally went to the hotel that I'd signed, arranged for them. And the leader of the group, the pastor, slept with a man. This was a woman pastor. And a man that was not her husband, they're staying in the same room together. And in the van right there that was preaching, the van driver, as I was looking at the van driver preaching, I see in the corner of my eye, they were cuddling together. Unmarried, cuddling together, and staying in the same room. The man that this woman pastor was sleeping with, he claimed to be a prison chaplain back there in Maui, Hawaii. Well, at the time, I was going to the Immigration Detention Center, IDC, preaching amongst all the different Africans from Sierra Leone and Liberia during the Liberian Civil War and the Civil War in Sierra Leone. And all these refugees had come to those countries and were getting arrested with IDC. And I was able to go into the building, building number five, and preach the gospel and invited Mr. Prison Chaplain to join me, but he could not because he wanted to play golf. Because he had heard that sexy Thai women will wash your golf balls for you. And he wanted to see that, an adulterer full of lust. And the woman pastor hearing this would get jealous, but a high man with a giggle. <laughs> but you tell she was jealous. This man was an adulterer. This man was full of lust. This man was a sinner. And yet here he was on a mission team. They didn't want to join us in preaching the gospel. They didn't come out with us at all. They didn't want to join us in preaching the gospel in prison. They didn't come with us at all. 
What they wanted to do was me to take them to a Thai church so that they could be encouraged. They came on the mission field to get encouraged. Now, the recent country in today's world is South Sudan. That's the newest country, South Sudan. Not Sudan, South Sudan. Sudan is broken up. South Sudan is the recent country, the latest country in the world today, the newest country. They're in dire poverty from the war. They had nothing there. They have not, not a thing there in that country. Could you imagine going to South Sudan to find a nice restaurant to eat at? I'm coming to South Sudan as a minister, and I want to find a nice restaurant to eat at. That'd be hypocrisy. Remember back in the 80s when Ethiopia was a big deal, and there are people starving in Ethiopia, and, and there the whole world is trying to save Ethiopia. Can you imagine somebody going to the Ethiopia, a do-gooder, but wanting to go to eat a five-star hotel and find a nice meal to eat? There's missionaries today, mission teams, who come to the mission field not to serve the Lord, not to preach the gospel, but they want to get encouraged. They want to be encouraged. Why? Because they're in sin. They don't have the Lord with them. Therefore, they want to be encouraged and strengthened in their sin, in their wickedness. That they can find somebody to bless and give money to and do some do good work. They think they've done a good job, though they're completely in sin and are hypocrites. These are what the false teachers do today. These are how the false teachers are today. They want to be encouraged in their sins. They want to go to church. They write an encouraging word. They want to hear encouraging words from the Bible. That's why they don't read the authorized for the Bible when it has words like repent, when it has words like hell. So they go to other versions of the Bible. So take repent out. They take hell out and replace it with Hades or something else. You don't know where that is. And they feel happy now because they have a Bible that have sodomite, that have repent, that have hell, that have fornicator. They take these words out of their Bibles. So now they get encouraged. They, they, even though they're fornication, they can read the Bible and get encouraged from it and strengthen in their sins. And then we go to churches today where they hear encouraging words. Back in 2000, had to rebuke a man at the door of a church at Bible school in Hawaii. My wife and I led a whole group of Thai hearted to the Lord. They began going to church, praise God. And, and not just a few, they're starting to bring them all. And we're starting to have a, a bit of a little bit of a revival amongst Thai hearted in Hawaii as we're preaching the gospel of them. And they all fell away because one man in the church a man who get up there from the pulpit and preach about holiness. He had a bit of a center. He got to be holy. And he preached about holiness. They knew him from the bars. And now they knew him from the bars. He has one of the most wicked, the most aggressive, just grabbing girls and grinding them. They knew this man preaching the pulpit church to be holy. And they knew him from the bars. And they all fell away. Well, I rebuked them for trusting and looking to man. But they fell away nonetheless. And then I went to rebuke that man face to face. Went to where he worked. He was a bus driver. And he had a stop there in Alawana Shopping Center. And I timed it where to rebuke him to his face for what he did in his hypocrisy. And what was his answer back to me? He wasn't that, oh, I didn't do that. You're lying. No. You're supposed to encourage me. You're not encouraging me. And that's what he got mad at me about. For not encouraging him in his sin for rebuking him. That's the way the churches have become today. They want to be encouraged in their sin. They want to continue in their sin, not hear rebuke, not hear reproof, not hear exhortation to repent. They want to continue their sin and go to church and hear things that encourage them in their sin. God still loves you. God overlooks your sin. Just look to Jesus. That's all you got to do. There's nothing you can do. They want to hear false teaching that encourages them in their sin, strengthen the hand of wickedness, strengthen the hand of evildoers, so they would not return from their wickedness. They refuse to repent. That's what Nicholas did back there in the Bible. He taught Gnosticism. If you just believe certain things, it doesn't matter what you do. That's what the Gnostics taught. What does Gnostic mean? It means knowledge. Instead of having faith with works, they base their faith on knowledge. If you just knew the right things, they knew the right theological things, and answer a theological test, it doesn't matter how you live. 
as long as you believe the right things and know the right things. That was Gnosticism. That's what the early church came against. Their deeds were evil. Their deeds were so evil, the Lord said he hated their deeds because of their doctrines. And the early church came against them because they didn't have works. Their deeds were evil. They refused to repent. They continued their wickedness, yet could claim that they're Christians and think they were saved. The Bible says, Thou shalt call this name Jesus, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, for he shall save his people from their sins. The Bible never says he'll save you in your sins. He'll save you from your sins. That's why he preached to repent. Yet today they think they can be saved in their sins. Today they think they can go to heaven without repenting. Today they think they can ignore the word of God or use corrupt Bible versions that take repentance out and still make it to heaven when Christ says, except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Nicholas taught them in Gnosticism it didn't matter what they did. They could live any old way. And they did. Based on his teachings. And they lived like sinners. And thought that they were saved. This is what the Bible warns us about. And today they're everywhere. Many coming in the name of Jesus. Not preaching repentance. Not preaching against sin. Not preaching about being born again. Becoming a new creature in Christ. Preaching and said... Just pray this prayer. Just believe the right things. You'll be once saved, always saved. And it doesn't matter how you live your life. That's Gnosticism. That's what the other church came against. And that's what they're teaching today. Many, in the name of Jesus, from blood-bought, spirit-filled churches, many deceiving the people today, thinking they can continue sin and still go to heaven when they die. That word here in the authorized version of the Bible is still applicable today. Repent. For except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Christ says it is a straight gate, it is a narrow way to life, and few there be that find it. Therefore, must do as the apostle says. To make our calling and election sure. To work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And in the fear of God, we must perfect holiness. For without holiness, no man shall see God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word which endureth forever. For thy word is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. Pray in the Lord's name and sanctify to thy truth. For thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.